I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internet where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about web font generators, ECMAScript 6 features, accessibility, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have this app for Mac OS X called Font Prep. Really sorry, Windows users, but this is pretty cool if you are on OS X. It's called the Missing Font Generator for Mac OS X. Ooh, look at that. There's a little asterisk there. Ah, oh, yeah, it says requires Mac. So I was hoping it was going to say Windows coming soon. It doesn't. Uh, it's a free app, though. You can go ahead and download it, and then you can drag your fonts onto the font prep window, and it does a couple of things for you. First, it can convert your TTF or OTF font files to WOOF, uh, EOT, or SVG. I actually got the first one wrong. WOFF. Woff. Say, thank you, Jason. Uh, it can also do CSS for you. So you drag it on, and you can get the CSS font face declarations that you're going to need to embed that into your site. So they have a little video here of what it looks like. I'll play this really quick, but basically if you have some font files on your desktop, you can drag them over to the app, and then after you've done that for all of your fonts, you can look through them and see what each character is going to look like. So if you use a lot of different fonts, if you are constantly designing websites, trying to look for the perfect font in your collection of fonts, this is a great handy little app because you can look through them, see what each font looks like, and then grab the code that you need. I personally like to use uh, Google Fonts, but some people don't like Google Fonts because of the variety. There's uh, not every font on the planet is on there, of course. So yeah, Thanks, Google. Yeah, seriously. How about putting every font on the planet in there next time? So if there's some fonts that you want to use that you need your own code for and you have them legally licensed, you can go ahead and use Font Prep. You know, it was kind of cool how you had a YouTube video playing on there. And this, like, people are probably watching the Treehouse show on YouTube. It's like YouTubeception. Yeah. Wow. Next up, we have a code guide by Mark Otto. Now, you may know Mark Otto, who is at MDO on Twitter. He is one of the original creators of Bootstrap. So he put up a code guide on here, which is going to be standards when developing your different web pages and projects. Now, why in the world would you want to have a code guide? Well, he says it right here in the golden rule. Um, you need to enforce these different code um, variables and things on your project so that every single line of code should appear to be written by a single person no matter the number of contributors. Now this is going to make a lot more sense when you get more people on the project and as your project starts getting larger and larger it's very important to have standards so that new people can just jump on and everything looks like he says it was written by a single person. So there are a bunch of different suggestions on here from how to write your HTML, what doc type to use, what character encoding to use, and this even specifies things like attribute order in um, all the different HTML attributes. So maybe start with class, IDs, names, and the different data attributes. Now it's important to note that you don't need to follow every single one of these things. What you need to do is follow what makes sense for your particular team and then create your own code guide. Now this is just a set of suggestions which works for him, so definitely check it out. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Well, next up is Marvel, which is a web app that allows you to rapidly prototype your websites, web applications, and other sorts of digital interfaces. So if we scroll down the page here, there's a couple of different areas where you can see how Marvel works. Basically, you take your PSDs, JPEGs, GIFs, or PNG images, and you can drag them into Marvel or sync them with Dropbox. That's actually the big thing here is that there's Dropbox integration. And then you can make them interactive. So you can, stay, you can take these static images and add some interactivity to them. What does that look like? Well, once again, we are going to look at this little demo video real quick. First, YouTubeception. You, <laughs> actually, it's Vimeoception uh, on this one. I know. 
So you can take your static mockups and you highlight different areas of them that you want to be clickable and then you tell Marvel where that needs to link to next. And once you've done that, you can click through your app just like this. Whoa, look at that. What? You can click on that button. Are we in an app right now? And it will look interactive and you can actually apply nice little transitions to each screen there. So this is really handy if you're doing pixel perfect mockups in Photoshop and you want to really nail the interactivity of the app before maybe you spend a lot of time, say, building an iPhone app in Objective-C. You don't want to like rapidly iterate on, on it. You just want to make sure you get it right the first time. This is a really great way to do that. Yeah, it's very cool stuff. I would, I would call it marvelous. Next up, we have a link to a GitHub repository on the upcoming features of ECMAScript 6. Now, ECMAScript 6 is going to be the upcoming version of the ECMAScript standard, which is more commonly referred to as JavaScript. Now, we'll slowly see ECMAScript 6 support rolling out in browsers and uh, maybe even something like Node as this language standard gets to be a little bit closer to the standardization process. Now, some of the features that you'll see in there is the concept of arrows. If you've used CoffeeScript, you'll be used to the arrow and the fat arrow. Now, what in the world does this do? Well, this changes the binding of the different function that you get that you send in there. So, the scope inside of a function with a fat arrow is going to apply to the scope that it is immediately outside of. Wow, that's quite a bit to take in, but if you've ever spent a lot of time wrestling with the different property of this or scope in JavaScript, this is a very welcome addition because it saves you um, just a little bit of coding. Now, there's a ton of different features in here. Uh, ECMAScript 6 has classes, which is going to be syntactic sugar over prototype-based object inheritance. Uh, it's got enhanced object literals, so you can actually create prototypes for different objects and just a ton of different stuff. Now, we don't have time to go into absolutely everything on here, but for more information, check out the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash gotreehouse or find us in iTunes, search for The Treehouse Show. Next up on the Negativity Sandwiches blog, that sounds uh, kind of tasty, maybe not. Does I don't it? know. No, I'd send that back. Yeah. Uh, there's this wonderful post about accessibility uh, from Jen Schiffer. I think I'm saying her last name wrong. I hope not. But it's a really wonderful post reminding all of us why accessibility is important. So it doesn't necessarily go into the details about how to make a website accessible because as she says in the article, there are plenty of resources like Treehouse that can help you do that. But it's a reminder about why accessibility is important. So in this post, she offers a couple of anecdotes that are pretty fascinating and really highlight very specific instances about uh, why you want to make your site accessible. And she also highlights this kind of logical fallacy basically where uh, people that are able-bodied and sighted will create these websites and they make them you know kind of low contrast or they include these small cute icons because they're you know aesthetically pleasing to somebody that has perfect vision but it really doesn't take into consideration people that maybe don't have per perfect vision or particularly people that don't have vision at all. So definitely check this one out. She offers a couple of resources at the bottom that can help you learn about accessibility techniques, but it's something that's very important and it's always good to be reminded of why you should make your sites accessible. It's easy to forget about it when you're kind of, you know, in a hurry trying to get an app out the door and you just want to get it done and get it in front of people. It's, uh, it's easy to forget about accessibility when, in fact, it's really, really important. Nick, speaking of vision. You're a vision. Is that what you were going to say about me? Yeah. Same Z's. Next up, we have a blog post about promise anti-patterns. Now, when we say promises, it's not like I'm telling Nick, hey, I'm just going to go to the grocery store for milk and then I never come back. We're talking about JavaScript promises, which is going to be little different uh, snippets of code that you can execute after a synchronous code has already run. Now, 
Promises aren't part of JavaScript right now, but they are part of a project called Q.js. So if you can't wait for them to be a standard, you can download that right now. So let's take a look at some of the different problems with promises. So let's say you want to run a different bit of code after one promise completes. So you can load something and then do something else and then load another thing. Well, hey, that's not exactly what you want to do. Uh, to fix that, you can use the all method of promises and then spread that out among the different return values and or functions. So this breaks it down into a bunch of different anti-patterns that you might see from the broken chain, the collection kerfuffle, uh, the ghost promise. These all sound like dance moves. I, I can't get past that. Um, but anyway. Uh, Let's see a few of them right <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can't. There's just not enough room. I'm mic'd up, but uh, you know, otherwise, yeah, totally. Uh, anyway, this is a, a great guide to read, and it's definitely going to improve your JavaScript coding. So check that out. Well, if you're not in the mood for a negativity sandwich, how about a graphic burger? Wow, you I'm see? suddenly very hungry. See how this all ties together? Yeah. Uh, graphic burger is tasty design resources made with care for each pixel. So. Basically, it's just a gallery where you can check out resources for graphic designers. So if you're designing a website, which maybe you are if you're watching this show, you can check out mock-ups. So there's a couple of different mock-ups here that you can use for inspiration. There are UI kits. So if you're trying to prototype an app quickly, you just want to get something together, you can use UI kits like these to prototype your app or maybe actually make a pixel perfect mock up. There's an icons category. So, if you love all the icons we talk about on the show here, you can check out a lot of them along with others right here. And there's a few other categories. Not a whole lot to say about it, but it is very cool. I haven't really seen something like this put together where it has nice categories like this where you can check out resources for designers. So very nice stuff. I like it a lot. Very, very cool. Next up, we have a project called nanobar.js. Now, this is similar to projects we've talked about on the show before. What this is is a YouTube-style small progress bar that goes across the top of the web page, and then you can call it programmatically. So let's take a look at that. If you take a look at the top of my screen here, you'll see there is a bar up there. And I, if I hit nanobar.go60, whoa. Look at that, it moves to the right, or if I say nanobar.go100, bam, we're all the way, all the way across there. Uh, now, that's it. It does one thing, and it does it very, very well. In fact, this is only 730 bytes gzipped. It's practically non-existent. Now, it's got just a couple of different options. It does not require jQuery at all, and then boom, you're good to go. Just include the script, and then say new nanobar, and you are done. You can change the background color and give it the ID of the div you want it to use. And then you just call the go method, and that's it. You are done. You got nanobar. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at JCypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash GoTreeHouse, or check us out on iTunes, search for The Treehouse Show, and please leave us a rating. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.